Hi everyone, um, I'm Naina Bajeko, I'm the Deputy International Editor of Time Magazine. Uh, thrilled to welcome you all today to this digital lunch plenary um, with these four guests, Chris Gopalakrishnan, Anish Shah, Dinjan Sinha and Deborah Winsler. Today we're going to be discussing whether climate change commitments have receded during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the coronavirus crisis, CO2 emissions have gone down and scientists have confirmed that air quality in certain regions have improved as industries and transport slowed to a halt. But how sustainable is this in the long term? As countries exit lockdown, activists are starting to raise awareness of what this will actually mean for the climate going forward. With big climate conferences like COP26 postponed, how can we make sure that businesses and governments continue to prioritize decarbonization? I'd like to call on the panelists just to introduce themselves and say a few remarks. So, Gunjan, can I start with you? No. <clears throat> Thank you, Naina. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, talking on such an important topic uh, right from Palo Alto, California. Been here last 30 years, been an entrepreneur, building companies, and really last 15 years I've been working on Metric Stream as their executive chairman, thinking about risk. And, and this pandemic, in my mind, brings to surface the whole issue of risk. One of the biggest risk events in the human history is right in front of us. But unfortunately, this is just a dry run, as I call it, for what's out there into the future. So it's it, at some level, there's a silver lining here that allows us to learn from this and drive for better resilience and better preparedness as we look forward. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today and, and especially from the lens of risk and data and technology. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Deborah, what about you? Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Good afternoon. And for me, early morning in Washington, D.C., um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Nina. And let me also uh, congratulate uh, our colleague, France, uh, Frank uh, Jürgen Richter for really his tremendous innovation and in having us online today for the uh, India Horasis Global Summit. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, which is an organization now about 35 years old that brings together CEOs, university presidents, labor leaders, and national lab directors. And we focus on all the drivers of next generation inclusive prosperity. And Innovation, of course, is the core driver of that, but very importantly, sustainability that takes us to resilient economies. So in this COVID uh, pandemic that we're navigating now, all of these three imperatives are more important than ever as we really begin to design for a new future um, of collaboration and partnership and resiliency. So I'm delighted to be here. I'll also say um, I'm president of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils that's um, a great organization, and we look forward to working with India and your colleagues in India um, in bringing the global competitiveness voices to play as we design the future. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you for joining so early in your morning. Um, Anish, I think you're you're in Mumbai, so hopefully a, a more reasonable hour for you. Can you tell That's us? That's right. I'm in Mumbai, and uh, thankfully it's uh, right early afternoon. Uh, Anish Shah, I'm with the Mahindra Group. Uh, Deputy Managing Director and Group CFO. Uh, I've been with Mahindra for the last uh, six years now. I was with GE for many years prior to that. And uh, at Mahindra, what I love is our philosophy, which is enabling our communities to rise. And uh, sustainability is a key part of that philosophy. And I'll talk a little more about that as we go on. Great, thank you. Um, and Chris, what about you? Can you say a little bit about yourself? Sure, and uh, uh, as everybody said, um, Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on an important topic. Uh, uh, you know, before the pandemic, uh, climate change was uh, one of the most important uh, global uh, challenges we were all faced as humanity. Uh, I think now we have been all uh, overtaken by the current uh, crisis that we are faced with. But, uh, you know, if you Think about medium to long term, uh, many of the challenges that we would see uh, will find a linkage with uh, climate change and sustainability. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, you know we are all healthy, which means climate change, impact of climate change, pollution, etc. Uh, we need to make sure that um, you know we we have a equitable. Uh, 
uh, population. So, you know, these are important topics and these are the things that I am now focused on as uh, a philanthropist, as a investor, um, as a uh, as a investor in research also. Uh, in the past, of course, uh, I've been uh, a CEO of Infosys, vice chairman, a co-founder, worked with Infosys for 34 years and stepped down. And now I work with uh, industry bodies. I work with entrepreneurs and startups. I work with governments. Uh, I work with the academic institutions to, to um, you know, uh, take forward uh, the, the broad agenda of an inclusive, sustainable growth for um, India and the world at large. Thank you, Chris. And, and I like the fact that um, one of the things that's emerged already is what kind of lessons we can learn from the pandemic. Um, the kind of fact that as a high impact risk, we know the kinds of things need to be acted on quickly. And that applies directly to the climate crisis, um, where delays will be just as devastating as they have been for countries who are slow to act with the pandemic. So this, uh, this idea that prevention is better than cure both applies to COVID-19, I think, and climate change when we talk about our most vulnerable populations in particular. But I want to talk about the fact that we're facing the significant economic downturn right now because of the pandemic. Um, how do we make sure that companies and governments don't neglect the climate when they're preparing to revive their economies? Deborah, is this something you could speak to for both in the U.S. context and, and globally? Well, one of the things, of course, that we're uh, experiencing real time is the, because of the pandemic um, is the really warp speed transformation of moving all of our activity into the digital world. Um, the telework, the teleeducation, the um, actual uh, ability to function without um, using our transportation networks of both uh, automobiles and air travel has really um, transitioned us into a new future where digitalization and the energy use and efficiency that that um, enables as we move to more electrification is got, going to have a huge positive impact on reducing carbon and certainly meeting many of the near term goals on decarbonization. So that's really a, a, a reality of just functioning and accelerating in the digital world. But I think most importantly, is the transformation in again at warp speed in global supply chain and how today companies throughout the world are reimagining their global supply chains both for smart localized uh, manufacturing of critical uh, needs they have the, the pandemic has certainly brought to center stage that we have to in our respective nations have access to critical pharmaceuticals, uh, medical supplies, PPE, and the whole infrastructure for health, which of course, again, is very much related to sustainability and climate. So we're seeing many, many businesses now as they uh, reinvent or redesign their global supply chain, building in sustainability and carbon neutral use of materials from the get-go. And this is very, very exciting. Um, smart manufacturing has been with us, but now it's really moving forward. So in a way, um, the pandemic, in a positive sense, if you can say that, is really uh, accelerating our transformation of global supply chains and our ability through businesses to really um, move towards a carbon neutral world. And really what I know we'll talk about, the circular economy, the dematerialization, the ability to um, ensure that as we produce and consume what we need in businesses and citizens, we do that with sustainability <clears throat> at the top of the agenda. So in some senses, while the climate issues perhaps are not at center stage among policymakers, we're having very positive benefits in reaching many of these goals through what business is doing in global supply chains and what citizens and consumers and communities are doing to really demand this new way of doing business. Thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to ask everyone to mute if they're not speaking, just because uh, there's a little bit of background noise. Um, uh, so you, you mentioned this kind of increased demand among consumers for sustainability. 
uh, particularly in India. Anish, is that something you could talk about, about how that's kind of accelerated during the pandemic? So one of the things we've seen during the pandemic is that cities are suddenly much better places to live in. The air is much cleaner. Right? We've had some of our cities rank fairly high on a list that we would not like to be, which is around the poor air quality index. And uh, those cities right now are great to live. We see birds chirping, which you know we'd never really heard before in cities, at least in some of our cities. Uh, some places see the Himalayas from the plains. So consumers are starting to see a different world and see the benefits of uh, climate change uh, or of greening in a sense. Let me talk a little about the Mahindra journey and what we are doing differently going forward. For Mahindra, actually, this journey began in 2008, uh, well before it became a global concern. And uh, at that point, we set a target to lower our carbon emissions by 3% uh, in the next three years, uh, which was achieved in the first year. And uh, that, in fact, started a lot more enthusiasm amongst everyone. In 2016, we set a target to lower carbon footprint by 25% in three years, which we achieved. Uh, our Igatpuri plant is India's first plant to be carbon neutral. And there have been a lot of actions that have been taken uh, because this, again, is consistent with our rice philosophy that I spoke about. As we think about today and, and where we go, uh, the two key things are greening our businesses, uh, which is really doing everything that we can from a climate uh, sustainability standpoint. And second is uh, developing more green businesses. Uh, we have businesses today in micro education, in auto recycling, um, waste to energy, and these are businesses that will grow electric vehicles, solar energy. And uh, we are putting a lot more capital against these businesses as we feel there's a lot more uh, need for them in the current world. Thank you for that. Actually, um, I think that's a good chance for me to refer to one of the questions that's been put to the group. Um, so Advit Jos Joshi, the CEO of Clean, asks if investors, funders, donors and corporations are actively, actively incorporating green indicators as part of their investment framework? And if yes, how can that be accelerated? I'm wondering who feels like they can answer that question. Um, I know, Chris, you work a lot with, with startups, but Gunjan, you're in Silicon Valley, so maybe. <laughs> let, me, let me take that. Uh, I think what I'm seeing is, you know, renewed focus on ESG and uh, a lot of sustainability-oriented you know, investments and, and financial services products and offerings. But I think the way I look at it, sustainability and performance are the flip side of the same coin. And we have to understand that you cannot deliver real performance, real value if you cannot create a sustainable framework. And I think about a sustainable framework is when you can actually drive global standardized data exchange because data is the new oil. It is the new driver of the modern digital economy but if you can do that in a risk-aware manner, in a carbon-aware manner, in a privacy-aware manner, that's when you call it an ethical data exchange framework between nations, between companies, between societies. And I think that's the infrastructure that we have to build as we think about not just this pandemic, but what's out there to come, especially if you look think, think through the climate change, which to me is the, is the next shoe that could drop, unfortunately, and we've got to prepare for it now. And do you think we've learned lessons from the pandemic in terms of how to build these models that use citizens' data without affecting civil liberties? Because we've seen quite different models emerge in different parts of the world to tackle this, this issue. Yes. And Anna, the, the way I look at it is, you know, I, I, I kind of think about there are four waves of risk. You know, the first one hit us in 2008. That's the financial risks, you know, and we learned a lot, you know, as a, as a society, as, as, as the world about how to deal with financial risk after the Bear Stearns, you know, Lehman Brothers collapse and the whole world kind of come, coming to a standstill. Uh, the second element of what we have seen as a next wave of risk is being around this whole digital and cyber risk, you know, as the world has gotten connected and interconnected and we have enjoyed the benefits of that digital interconnection, you know, cyber and digital risks have also multiplied and we have now begun to put focus to that. The third risk that I feel that kicked off this year is what I would call biological risks. Risks because as humanities, as humans, we are interconnected, you know, and that biological risk results in things like pandemics that what we're experiencing. So we need to create systems, frameworks, approaches, and data exchange protocols that allow us to effectively deal with these things. 
And it was precisely the lack of these things that this thing became a worldwide pandemic. Now, come going into the future, I think there'll be a framework for biological risks that companies, countries, and societies will create. But the last one, which I think is yet to come, is we do not have a framework for a global climate risk data exchange. And I think these are the four risks, the financial risks, the cyber risks, the you know biological risks, and the climate risks that as a society, as a business, as a country, you know, we've got to go deal with and make it happen. Thank you for that. And I think one of the one of the things that we've talked about a little bit earlier that I'd like to return to is the way in which the pandemic kind of highlighted existing vulnerabilities um, it, in individual societies across the world. Um, how does that link to the climate? Would anyone feel like to talk about that? Debra, you're muted. Oh, Deborah, I think you're still on mute. <laughs> yeah, now you're off. Thank you. In the United States, one of the challenges that we had with the pandemic, and we're still dealing with this, is a fundamental structure in our governance system between the federal government and the role of states and regions in determining so many of the policies, the regulations, and responses to any activity, whether it's health or education. And we've seen a, a very uneven strategy roll out for dealing with the pandemic. And I think this also applies on other measures that impact, you know, reaching uh, carbon goals. Uh, we've seen over the years, California has been a state that's been much more active in its regulatory framework around energy efficiency and moving, you know, from uh, fossil fuels to more clean energy sources. So that's a structural issue that every country has to deal with. And, you know, just building on the last comments on the importance of the data and the risk, I think one of the other really powerful things we have to learn from from the pandemic is how to really begin to build uh, communities of data driven trust and verification of data. Because the early models that came out about the pandemic, its spread, mitigation, you know, made a huge impact on policies. And many of these, of course, pr proved to be not correct, and yet they had a huge impact. So we're going to need really global partnerships around data sharing, data standards, and this transparency and verification of data because and information. Because I think until we have that and the trust, because we're really operating in a, in a deficit of trust right now, I think it will be very hard to get the global partnerships that we need and global commitments that we need to really accelerate the, the, the steps that have to be taken on climate mitigation. Uh, Gunjan, if I can come in here. Uh, see, uh, first thing is um, this pandemic was unexpected and caught us all by surprise and we were unprepared. We scrambled around to prepare ourselves to respond. We are seeing more and more climate-related uh, events where uh, you know the impact has been significant. Now, the impact, if you look on all such events, this you know uh, disasters, uh, the impact is uneven. So, if you take work from home, for example, the white-collar workers, those. Uh, people who are in the services business, you know, the high-end services business could actually work from home. Those people who work in factories, those two people who are daily wage earners, they got impacted significantly, right? Uh, similarly, you know, in any disasters, what happens is climate-related disasters. It's the uh, people who are living in uh, low-lying areas, people who are, you know, uh, Poor, who are the ones which, who get affected very much, actually. So we, we do see inequality um, and inequality affecting how people respond to such disasters. So as we address issues related to climate change, we have to broaden our definition of sustainability. And that's what all my fellow panelists are saying, that we must actually build 
capability and capacity in every strata of society we need to make sure that we have ability to respond equally so starting from maybe um, a, a a a minimum uh, income program right to uh, you know how do you look at um, minimum i know level of housing minimum level of education etc because that's required now when i look at india for example uh, india has the lowest per capita consumption of power consumption of energy compared to all large economies so is it fair that india must take a higher load in terms of uh, emissions and things like that having said that india took an aggressive target to comply with the paris agreement and comply with you know uh, meeting the requirements by 2050 and before the pandemic india was on target to reach the tar- uh, uh, reach uh, levels at 2040 sir 10 years even before the 2050 and this is driven of course one the low per capita consumption second india's investment into renewables india has been one of the highest seen one of the highest investments in renewable energy third the leadership of companies like mahindras all the large companies in india if you look at they have all committed to significant reduction in their carbon footprint you now there are companies in india who are looking at net zero infosys is an example we made the commitment way back in 2011 and by 2030 infosys committed to become net zero and one of the companies along with amazon who have signed up to that actually so driven by industry driven by government and driven by supported by people we are on target but i think you know having said that we also need to look at the broader definition of sustainability sustainable society and make sure that uh, we address um, basic needs of um, of uh, our citizens uh, and and this is something we need to look at from a global perspective not just india and and then only we will be able to create a resilient society yeah let, let, let me just add to what you're saying right i mean and that is why i feel like we've got to look at it holistically and in an integrated way you know we've got to look at it from a financial risk perspective and financial inclusion how do you build resilience at that level where it is not just about the climate in the vacuum but in a comprehensive approach to saying okay are we creating a sustainable financial framework are we creating a sustainable digital framework which is where digital risks are you know for example we touched upon the topic of digital divide or you talked about even risks around cyber and and then you go into how we we are talking about this whole element of of uh, you know the, the the risks around you know the biological risks and how we are interconnected together as a society there are a lot of examples of things that we have to learn and bring it all together because in preparedness for the climate exchange and yes there are protocols right now like tcfd which is which talks about financial disclosure of the climate you know the task force and things of that nature but it's not in the isolation will we find the problem or the answer we've got to get this in a framework that is a little bit more integrative as chris that you highlight and i think the data is the answer i mean if we had the data of what's happening in china ahead of time i can assure you the world would have reacted a little differently than the way we did and so the part of the learning here is how does the data flow in an ethical way in a global way and there are standards that we as civic society and governments have to go formulate in advance of the next shoe to drop i i want to pick up on something that chris also mentioned about the kind of how the energy consumption in india is low per capita and part of that is because um india still has quite a lot of development to do to move away, to become a, a wealthier society um given that how how can india kind of still establish a new model of development without massively increasing its carbon footprint you, you mentioned what businesses can do but i'm curious as to whether there's there's a kind of bigger rethinking of how how india does this so um i firmly believe so and this is why um india is very important for the rest of the world because india is not a developed for example only 4% of indians own cars 10% of indians can 
afford to own a car and uh, imagine you know the impact on pollution the impact on traffic on the roads impact on commute times so we need to think about a new model for our cities how do you reimagine your cities now this is the same for every uh, development agenda that you can think of for example in healthcare can you provide affordable inclusive healthcare for every citizen 1.3 billion people in india healthcare is you know if i may say so debra broken even in the us because it's not affordable now for most people imagine if you follow the same model in india it would be disaster even 1% of people can't afford the healthcare that is necessary uh, it's true for education it's true for everything actually you know water everything that you can think of it's true so that is why in the 21st century the best innovative minds the best people who can bring models to market products to market must look at how it can be provided in india now one positive example let me tell you uh, digital connectivity india has probably the best uh, telecom network in the world at the most affordable prices you know 4g coverage is almost throughout this country and and you will all be interested to know that at 400 rupees which is approximately about uh, 6 dollars approximately 6 dollars per month we can get unlimited calls unlimited messages and 1 gb of data every single day that means aggregate for a month you get 30 gb of data at 6 dollars per month now how did this happen it's because of the volumes that india provides you know 1.3 billion and competition and new technology all of this combined so this is what india provides and i think we need to look at you know what is the mobility model what is the healthcare model what is the education model and the pandemic has given us some clue you know for example we are doing this conference digitally so that people around the world can participate you know this should be the norm in the future physical conferences should be exception only if you need to be in the same room looking face to face and having a lunch or dinner together you need to have a physical meeting otherwise you know if you are going to exchange our ideas the the digital medium is probably the best to do this so that the maximum number of people can participate uh, nana just to add to what uh, chris says the answer is not incrementalism because that's not going to get us anywhere it has to be a leapfrog or a radical change similar to what we talked about with regard to data availability in india uh, one of the attendees uh, has a question around innovating to zero and uh, that actually is a solution uh, to india we have to look at zero emission products we have to look at uh, zero waste and these are things that will take us to the next level because anything incremental won't get us there thank you that's a very helpful addition i was actually going to ask you uh, one of the other questions uh, in the group i don't know if you if you saw it it was directed to you about how you view the future of synthetic fuels such as bio cng um so, and how that relates to the mahendra group i guess yeah i saw that question and uh, from a technical standpoint the answer is yes that has uh, great applicability the question is more around how do we make it available how do we make it simple to use and is it scalable so one of the challenges we face in our waste to energy plants is the ability to get that level of waste to make it scalable we have nine plants today around the country and we are looking at uh, putting in another 10 or 15 plants but for every single plant it's still at a very small scale and uh, the segregation of waste becomes a challenge as well because waste is not segregated at the household level across india uh, as it is in many developed countries so these are some of the challenges you face in terms of implementation and that that is something that can be an impediment uh, even to bio uh, cng as we go forward thank you for answering that um we the concept of resilience has come up a few times so far in this conversation um i'd like to go a bit deeper into that so why do we need to build resilient societies how does that link to sustainability as well as just 
the pandemic that we're talking about. So, yeah. Now, yeah. So let me let me take this one because one of the things which we have launched within our own company, Metric Stream, is this this whole notion of resilience spotlight. I think you know, given the times that we are living in, there's so much negativity of risks and challenges and problems and so forth. I want to change the discussion around resilience, and I want to talk about the silver lining here. How do we build more resilience at an individual level? How you deal with it at a at a at a company level, at a country level, and so forth. And resilience must be on the spotlight, and it teaches us how to build resilience in the very fabric of any system. And that's that resilience must be the agenda, and that must be the part of the policy framework, whether it's at a corporate level or whether it's at a community level. And I think we are beginning to see some of the initiatives kind of form out in that arena. And you've got to take an integrated approach to it. You've got to look at the financial side. You've got to look at the digital divide and the digital side. You've got to look at it from a biological and human perspective and the climate perspective in an integrated whole. As you build that resilience as a real framework, the way you have preparedness, where you can take minor shocks and where you can take multiple risks at the same point, and where you can design the system by default to handle that. that's the system that's going to operate and that's the system that we have to co innovate and design moving forward you know to me this is a challenge for silicon valley i mean i put that that discussion last year we did an event at stanford to exactly bring out some of these topics much ahead of this covid-19 and we did not know this was coming but this is a topic that is front and center in the discussion right now so let me take this as a, a way to illustrate uh so the the pandemic has impacted older people more than younger people you know they are dying in more numbers why because they have comorbidities now if you look at the current model for healthcare 70% of the expense in healthcare happens in the last 3 to 5 years of a person's life because that's when they fall really sick and they get hospitalized and you start spending money when you know that the person is not going to live for more than 3 to 5 years it doesn't look look like a waste in some sense though nobody would stop spending we need to shift the focus to prevention we need to shift the focus to biomarkers and you shift the focus to actually healthy aging so today we are able to actually monitor ourselves on a systematic basis with modern medicine and this will not cost us more in the future because we will have simple wearable devices simple lab tests that we can do uh, which will be done automated way using ai and machine learning uh, and and the person can actually eat well exercise well meditate and look at their um, mental health and it will all be indicated through the biomarkers that we capture and and this then allows us to relook at how we spend money on healthcare and this is what building resilience is all about building resilience is all about monitoring certain parameters on a continuous basis real time basis adjusting these things in real time such that we avoid disasters from happening and everybody gunjan talked about if you had data feed from china we would have noticed this you know i i just talked about debra talked about these things actually so we have now numerous signals that are coming data points that are coming and last thing i want to say here is we need to rethink about this concept of privacy privacy in the future will not mean that uh, my data should not be touched i think my data should be accessible to provide me certain services and only those services i think that should be that it should not be misused it not be used for other things without my permission the permission piece is the new way of defining privacy even i think that's what we need to move towards so one one sorry I'd one like thing which i wanted to add on the privacy yeah I, one I just one quick to thing that the discussion sorry. on resiliency another dimension of this and this is this whole nexus of resiliency in the ecosystem of food energy and water because these three systems really require tremendous uh innovation and transformation and i would say india is a potential 
almost a, a major test bed to take us to a new place in terms of the resiliency of food systems and how it links to water and then the production and use of energy. You know, being able to be a country that is one of the first, I mean, there are others that are doing this, but to move to precision agriculture, because with the uh, uh, tremendous amount of digital capability in the hands of individuals in, in industry, and Chris, you talked about that, and you know, the mobility, being able to deliver this to the individual farmer and move beyond really 19th and 20th century agricultural processes that are not you know, environmentally friendly with nitrogen and many other things is a tremendous opportunity. And again, um, this is all part of the, 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 the digitization that we're seeing that has a huge impact on climate, but they're huge equity issues. And for instance, in the United States, we still have a tremendous divide between the access to 5G and broadband capabilities throughout our country. You know, when you had universities like Arizona State University, our largest public university, within a week putting 40,000 learners online, and yet in many communities in the country, their children that had no access to a computer and all of a sudden had to do their lessons online. So we have to have a way as we move forward in this sustainability and resiliency to address a lot of the equity issues. And I will say, you know, in the United States, this has come forward so fast now with the pandemic. You know, there was no question that communities in inner cities, uh, communities of color had a much different response and ability to deal with the COVID and get the treatment and testing. And this all re relates now as well to the social injustice issues um, in racial groups and particularly African Americans. And, and, you know, I think India has many of those issues to deal with as well. So it may be a very interesting area for collaboration in terms of um, the yeah. equity. And I have to joke because, you know, there's a new saying in the United States, maybe, okay, so much for smart cities. How about safe suburbs? And we're seeing, you know, a whole movement of, quote, the elite and the wealthy, you know, well, I'm not in New York City. I'm not in Chicago. I'm not in Boston. I'm out in my country home, safe and away, while, you know, the people that are delivering our food, doing all the service work that can't work remotely, they, they, are, they are the ones that are on the front line. So I think there are lots of social issues that we're going to deal with and important for collaboration between great democracies such as the United States and India. Yeah. In fact, uh, the one thing which I'm just building on what Deborah mentioned and what Chris said, you know, both the issues of equity and privacy are paramount importance. One of the collaborations that I'm actually involved in is an initiative called mprivacy.org, which is a nonprofit initiative where we are working with company, you know, organizations both in India as well as academic institutions here in US. And the whole idea that how do you bring data from mobile operators, telecom operators for societal good in a, in a framework that preserves privacy, that preserves you know, data equity and these kinds of issues, they become the framework for healthcare, climate risks and other things over time. But we have to bring those standards in place now. We can't wait for the next flood to hit us and then recognize that we don't have an infrastructure where we can save lives by, you know, a consent based system of, of helping people at that point of time. So one of the things which is happening is we've got to become preemptive and proactive now. And that's the wake up call that we all should be getting at this point of time. Yeah, I think that's an interesting um, note. We've got about five minutes left. And I think we, as much as we've talked about how the pandemic kind of offers these lessons for the future, I'd love to hear um, from each of you what you think are kind of specific commitment or policy you'd like to see put in place now for the near term to deal with the, the kind of multiple challenges that governments um, and companies are facing. So if there's anything you'd like to, to offer the room before, um, before we wrap up, I'd love to hear specific ideas if anyone has any. Let me start here. One thing I'd offer is, uh, again, linking back to what Gurinder has said here on the chat, which is leapfrog or otherwise innovation and climate outcomes must have net positive outcomes. And that is very important because while this is for societal good, 
and we have to take the leap to do that. Uh, it is sustainable only if it creates positive outcomes overall, and it's possible. We've done 1,900 projects, uh, and we've had an average 24% IRR on those 1,900 projects over the last five years. So that is possible to have positive outcomes. That's the way we should look at it. But at the same time, that may not happen overnight, and therefore having the trust to leap into it to be able to do a lot more is important. So from my side, you know, COVID has uh, given us an opportunity to reset and reimagine things. You know, we never imagined that we could stay uh, at home most of the time for 90 days and do all our work using digital means. But we have done it. We have got used to it. And the world goes on. You know, it's not uh, the end of the world, though a lot of suffering is there. But it tells us that, uh, you know, push to the extreme, we will change and we will adjust and we will make things happen. So can we reimagine every, um, every aspect of our life, every industry that we do to look at a sustainable future, uh, look at something, you know, you know, net zero homes, for example, you know, net zero buildings, net zero uh, industries and, you know, circular economy, regenerative agriculture, right? Uh, you know, we, we need to look at how even agriculture can be changed such that farmers' uh, income increase over time. So every aspect of our life we need to remind and it is possible. And this is an opportunity for India to be the um, the testing bed for these ideas because India is yet to develop. And this allows the rest of the world to partner with India. And of course, India is a huge market too. So I think, you know, here we we can look at a win-win a scenario for India, for the rest of the world and for the world at large. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and Chris, you know, just kind of looking at from the other side of the world, you know, standing here at 1.26 a.m. in Palo Alto, California, from Silicon Valley, and we have proudly created trillion dollar companies like Apple and Amazon and everything else, and which is awesome. But it's high time that we start to understand the power of what I call data-driven strategic philanthropy to find the answers. I would be much more proud if Silicon Valley created real strategic philanthropic answers using technology, AI, machine learning, with equity, with data privacy, with with you know reducing digital divide, not accelerating one. So my challenge to all the entrepreneurs you know who are in the room here listening to us is now is the answer, and I would like to see more initiatives around strategic philanthropy to solve societal problems at scale to help billions of people in one sweep. And I think that's possible now through technology from the place where I stand. And I would add to the wonderful comments of my colleagues that we all need to work um, in this concept of the democratization of innovation. We need to enable and unleash a whole generation of new innovators in our respective countries and globally. Because for instance, in the United States, yes, we have these great centers of innovation in Silicon Valley and Boston and our coast, but we have much uh, tremendous challenges in the rest of our country. I'm speaking of the US to expand the innovation capabilities around our universities, in our communities, in the revitalization of the Rust Belt. And it's going to take the uh, emergence of new models, new public-private partnerships, and actually um, transformation of, of businesses. So let's just look at higher education. If universities in the United States can't figure out how to deal with coming back in a physical way, as well as having tele-education. Many of them will go out of business. They will not exist. And we can't have situations in the United States, in our big cities, where billions and billions of dollars are poured into substandard schools and children are not getting the education to enable them to participate. So we have to really begin to design for new civilization and I think the most positive thing about the pandemic, if again, if we can look at any silver lining, it's perhaps made all of us think more about our humanity. And we're living in three generations often, we're doing things that perhaps many of us hadn't done, three 
imagining the joy of cooking and family life as we continue to do our work. And so perhaps we're going to see both a back to the future in our humanity as well as redesign for a new civilization. I think I think we're about to get um, booted off the platform. It's, it's the end of the talk. But thank you so much for all of your comments. Thank you, Chris, Gundan, Anish, and Deborah. It's so great to chat to you today. And thank you thank to you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Wonderful. Great job. Thank you, Nana. Thank you.